Okay, so it is February the 14th, 2014. Um, second day of being in learning 2.0. And in terms of the, um, the writing, going back to the original, this is the first day that it actually starts to look like something that is a bit more of a uh, organized narrative. <clears throat> Again, I don't have notes on the process, and that's um, that's beyond my recollection. Um, I I don't remember, you know, the days leading up to um, the experiment. That is to say, I don't remember, you know, what I was thinking in terms of okay, so in two days or in three days or night. I'm sure it wasn't so well thought out in advance that I said, you know, in this date, February 13th, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to start doing this. I, I'm fairly certain it was a uh, spontaneous somewhat decision. And um, I I have to say, I have a faint recollection in terms of whether or not I had said I'm going to do this daily thing. I'm pretty sure that I did, but I have no notes. Um, as soon as I got into it, then I was committed. Uh, for the year, but it wasn't as if I, you know, had like all this advanced uh, game planning that was going on. Uh, it, it absolutely was not. As I mentioned in my first uh, video yesterday, that um, it, um, it it came out of this paper that I read, uh, uh, that PSGB, that I read the other day that was written for PSGB, um, as I detail in the preface of the book, Being and Learning, that this is a kind of homage to. Um, the whole impulse to do this came out of a uh, real feeling that I wasn't really taking up the fundamental questions. But on four, February the 14th, 20, uh, 2004, second day into the experiment, that's when I started to type up um, what looks more like a narrative. And, uh, um, you know, one thing I'm going to add is that part of doing this is to do it when you can do it. And um, when it's relevant, I'm going to make um, um, sort of first-person comments and give some context. Uh, so, for example, um, once you get into a project like this, it's always on your mind insofar as you're uh, always thinking a day ahead <clears throat> to plan, okay, what am I going to do my hour? All right, so if you're doing it full-blown and for an entire year, um, you have to carve out that time. Um, and I don't know if anyone who's watching this would say, oh, it sounds, it doesn't sound that challenging or it sounds, it, it, it's unbelievably challenging in terms of, um, being able to carve out one hour each day, um, to sit down and to pick up where you were the day before, um, and go for it. And I've described yesterday that it's like reaching, that endorphin high that you get from working out, that you, you know, begin stiff, sore, uh, your muscles loosen up, you get going, then you're into it, you hit what is, what people would describe as a wall where you sort of know that if you push a little bit harder, you're going to get to a place that's going to take you a bit higher, um, and so you try to push beyond that. And in the same way with writing this piece. I would get to that point with language and with concepts. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because this is first thing in the morning, uh, um, and uh, I'm on very tight schedule. Um, I'm um, gathering my steps, my 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 things, and um, going back to Maine, <clears throat> starting from where I am in New Jersey. So I have to. Uh, a very short amount of time here to to do this, and uh, yeah, that's just that's just some context for that. So anyway, um, second meditation, and um, there's a heading to this, which means that at that point I thought that I was going to be taking up um, for a bit um, the theme of evocative speech. <laughs> evocative speech and um, in the notes that I wrote later um, I envisioned this being a section so it would say evocative speech with a semicolon 
the delivering forth of the questions. Okay. So at the end of the previous section, we arrived at the point where learning, being turned around, was understood to be enlisted or brought about by a peculiar kind of communicative performance. Thus, teaching which enlists this turning towards being, attentiveness, and attunement is named poetic. In this section, we must delve further into the meaning of this name and try to understand precisely why poetic is the proper name of the communicative performance that enlists learning. To begin, we look further at what is communicated in the turning around. First and foremost, we have said that the performance of teaching communicates teachability. Teachability is the capacity to learn. What is communicated is thus possibility. To be teachable is to be situated before possibility. Too often so-called teaching and learning are fixated on what is the allegedly important fact. Moreover, this fact has been singled out as important and uniquely worthy of our attention by political forces that exist in some distant place far from our experience. It's difficult to avoid cynicism under this condition. However, whether or not the content of formulaic education is appropriately deemed as necessary is beside the point. We call attention to this condition, which is structured by a kind of rationalism and positivism that is fixated on the fact or what is, in order to highlight the situation where teaching and learning have failed to be understood in their existential dimensions. Within this situation, we pass over these dimensions and proceed in a thoughtless manner. <clears throat> Seeking to avoid the condition that is devoid of thinking requires that we take up a second element of the turning. Thus we shall call the evocative inquiry because it is characterized by an evocative speaking that is expressed through provocative questioning. We're going to take up each of these in turn, but to do so uh, with the recognition that there are two parts, they are two parts of the same event or the same phenomena. In learning we are turned away from that which is towards that which is not. When we are placed within the situation of learning we are turned towards the excess beyond beings, towards what is absent from presencing and what is hidden from us. In this situation we are positioned as learners. In the previous section we named this position attunement and we called that towards which we are attuned being. But what is the proper name of being when we describe it as that which is absent and hidden? What? But what is the proper name of being when we describe it as that which is absent and hidden? Heidegger has called being beyond beings. Heidegger calls the being beyond beings nothing. Evocative inquiry unfolds in the question that provokes our attention to the nothing. In the essay, What is Metaphysics?, we identify a provocative question, one that begins this performance of learning. Heidegger formulates this question is, as, how is it with the nothing? The question is an exemplar of evocative speech. That kind of speaking, peculiar to this performance of teaching, that, as we have said above, evokes interpretation and thereby exposes the possibility that lies as the matter before us, the excess of being. The question, how is it with the nothing, points us toward the excess of being, described as the is not, not yet, beyond beings, or that which is. By pointing us towards being what is not not yet, the question evokes interpretation. When we say evokes interpretation, we recall the sense in which interpretation describes a response to a calling or a message. When we say is evoked, we mean something has been called upon or summoned forth. Evoke, to call, to voice, vocalize, 
shares the same root, vocare, as vocation, a commonly expressed description of teaching. Vocare, to call in the phonological sense through word. Vocation, from the Latin vocationem, a call or sense of fitness for an obligation to follow. A divine call or a spiritual injunction or guidance to undertake a duty. Evocative inquiry calls out or summons our attention to what is not yet. Our response to this call is properly named interpretation or hermeneutics. For Heidegger, interpretation or phenomenology as hermeneutics is rooted in the Greek word hermenuin. Through a playful thinking that is more compelling than the rigor of science, Heidegger refers Hermenuin to the noun Humaneus and then to the god Hermes. He says, quote, Hermes is the divine messenger. He brings the message of destiny. Hermenuin is that exposition which brings tidings because it can listen to a message. Such exposition becomes an interpretation of what has been said earlier by the poets who, according to Socrates and Plato's Ion, 534e, Hermenus Isan Ton Theon, that is to say, the poets are interpreters of the gods. End quote. Thus, the performance of teaching, which communicates teachability by delivering the message of possibility, the not yet, is carried forth through evocative poetic speaking. To repeat what we said at the conclusion of the preceding section, when we respond or heed because we have heard the call of being, we have become teachable. <clears throat> we now see further why becoming teachable, which is part of the condition for the possibility of learning, involves an ongoing response that can be likened to a, meditate, a mediating moment. One who properly teach, teaches is a pointer. And here we now can take up more fully what is meant when we say that the lover of learning is the animated teacher, the mythic poetic speaker, and the intensely attentive listener. So that was my first meditation or poetic phenomenological meditation. Now, one thing I want to say, and <coughs> I'm glad to see that it took me about 10 minutes to read that, because I took a little bit of time to uh, um, to introduce and to give some context and then read it. So if I could get this down to 20 minutes where I'm reading the meditation and then making some comments, that would be wonderful because I do hope that people do watch some of these. Um, so uh, right, so what was important that I was going to mention a couple things. As I was reading this, I was um, I was struck by how I kind of locked in really quickly to um, to this idea of being a poetic or mythopoetic speaker, right? So I was going to say that this category of poetic phenomenological <clears throat> or poetic phenomenology, um, poetic phenomenological meditations came to me later. Right. Um, this became the category of this type of thinking, this kind of writing um, that is documenting that thinking. It came to me later. But from the beginning, I'm making this distinct distinction <clears throat> between um, the kind of teaching that is evocative, that is um, poetic, and one that is, I suppose you could say prosaic, but I describe it here as 
being a uh, work of rationalism and positivism. So it's coming out of being more rational, uh, or more positivistic. And what I don't always do in this project um, is to try and just stand back sort of neutrally and just say, well, on the one hand, what I'm up to is this poetic, um, phenomenological, evocative approach to education. But there's this other one that is um, more positivistic. I do use this other one as a kind of foil, right? And now that's not surprising because when I was writing this in 2004, something uh, called No Child Left Behind, which was a federal policy that had been um, instituted for K through 12 schooling, um, that had really taken on some traction and it had connected with a phenomenon that was always already going on in the states, statewide, which was um, high stakes testing. So here I was a philosopher, trained as a philosopher. I had found my way into education, that is to say a college of education, and I was teaching at Hofstra. And what I saw, and I can clearly see it now looking back, was the sort of confluence um, between a couple of forces. The rise of um, the use of uh, measurements, analytic measurements, testing um, um, as a way to determine quality. So the testing of teaching and learning um, through the measuring of them through testing. So and then um, the desire. That's sort of driving the desire to fulfill whatever remnants there were of a kind of um, agenda to, to of general education, right? That, that there should be an education that everyone should receive <clears throat> and that our, our, our democracy and our, I suppose, our economy and people's everyday lives are made better if they perceived an education, high quality education. So all that was leading to just these top down, and, the, and this was in 2004, it's gotten to the point where it's just accelerated beyond itself. It's taken on a life of itself, um, which I don't want to get into too much right now. I have a whole year to unpack these things. But it was in that climate that I was writing you know, this experiment took off at the beginning of this time where um, testing began to drive education. And at higher education, at that point, we still felt far from that experience. And teachers were just starting to experience what it felt like to be um, in a place where uh, they had l uh, less and less um, of a role in determining what they were teaching and how they were teaching. And in a sense, they were becoming more and more um, members of the emerging service economy. <clears throat> and so it's in that climate that I start writing this. So the, um, the writing, the, 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 the philosophical ideas that I'm taking off with here are coming out of um, a sense that while that is the dominant form of education that's emerging, there is this other older, um, call it classical, more traditional form of education that I'd experienced, that I'd insisted on for myself from a pretty young age, actually. Um, a friend I had used to tease me because he said, and this is in high school, but it goes back before that, that I would always be complaining in my class, my French class, because I would always say, can't we just read? Because I like to just read, read French and, and talk 
in French and talk about the text that we're reading in French. And I didn't like all the grammar stuff and all the rules and all the, you know, conjugations and all that sort of stuff. And so, um, and I'm fairly certain that it goes back earlier than that. But anyway, so this is a other tradition of education. It just seemed to me that's what education was about, existential. So when I introduced this notion of the question, <clears throat> Heidegger's question, how is it with the nothing? And I described um, evocative inquiry as unfolding in the question um, about the nothing. That is to say, the nothing, uh, the question about the nothing pointing us to the excess of being, pointing us towards um, what is not, not yet. I'm clearly, um, what I'm trying to say is that in the time of positivism, in the time of um, <clears throat> rationalism in the time of education that is um, con controlling our attention towards a particular object or a particular prefabricated set of questions and answers and et cetera, et cetera. In that time, Heidegger's question, um, how is it with the nothing, which he himself was posing to scientists in that essay, um, <clears throat> what is metaphysics? It's become a really interesting question and a very important one and a very relevant one. So that question itself becomes the driving question for many of the meditations to go. It's the driving question of the of the work. How is it with the nothing? How is it with that which is not? How is it with that which is not yet? And to this day, I'm still focusing in my own work that I'm, 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 I'm plugging away at on this question. <clears throat> you know, um, I recall teaching that essay um, a lot um, those days when I was doing this project. And between 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2008, I used Walter Kaufman's book um, on existentialism. <clears throat> and I would always read this essay by Heidegger, who, and Heidegger himself revised it a number of times. It's sort of interesting. He kept coming back to it. So, um, so that's important. Um, and then to talk about the teacher as undertaking, um, of being poetic, I, I think this is important that I was very clear early on that um, poetic, <clears throat> um, the origin of my understanding of the poetic is this idea of the poet as a messenger, which is linking it to hermeneutics. So phenomenology as hermeneutics, um, that is to say phenomenology as delivering the message of the excess of being, right? So, and, and that's a whole interesting thesis in and of itself, because, you know, when we talk about phenomenology as offering up description, well, the, the description itself is not what is being described, right? It's something else. Um, and the description itself <clears throat> becomes something else, and it becomes something that we talk about. So it, it, it becomes something other than what it's describing, and it becomes something that we then talk about and take up. And so for me, this is precisely um, how teaching becomes evocative and it becomes um, the evocation of an attention to what is not. That is to say, an attention to the excess, to possibility. Now, much more to be said on this. And um, because this is what I end up just going at full blown is that whole nest of terms that I've just introduced in terms of the poetics, in terms of hermeneutics, in terms of the question of metaphysics, that is to say, what is, um, how is it with the nothing? And this category um, that I introduced in this first, uh, second meditation here, which is to say the excess of being, um, the is not slash not yet. Um, or what is beyond what is. I'll just keep coming back to that over and over and over again. And so just to you know sort of clarify then what the writing is itself is an attempt to be 
evocative. It's an attempt to do that sort of poetic thing, which is something I've already said, I'm sure, a number of times, but I felt it's important to underline that. So um, that is meditation number two from 2-14-2004, recorded, read, rather, again, 10 years later on 2-14-2014.